Order members, and it's now time for questions to the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. And I call Mr Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number one. With your permission, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I will answer questions one and eight together. The St. Andrews Agreement provided for a number of changes to the institutions which facilitated the restoration of devolution on May of 2007. The St. Andrews Agreement also provided that the devolved arrangements would be reviewed and a standing committee has been established by the Assembly to carry this out. The Deputy First Minister and I have had discussions on such matters on numerous occasions, including as recently as last week. It will be hoped that agreement could be reached between the parties on such matters. In my capacity as a party leader, I have made my own position clear and outlined what I believe needs to be done in order to deliver more effective and efficient institutions. Ultimately, however, it will be for each of the political parties to put forward their own proposals as to the reform of the current structures. It is in everyone's interest to participate in this discussion and to deliver the most effective and efficient form of government that we can achieve. Thank you. And I call Mr. Joe Byrne for something. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the First Minister for his answer. Can the First Minister outline if it is a lack of functionality in the structures or is the lack of professional relationships between the two office holders of OF, OFM DFM? And is there a problem in relation to those relationships in how decisions are made at the highest level of the executive? Well, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I am pleased to say that uh, relationships in OFM DFM have not descended to the levels when his party leader and the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party held those uh, positions. Uh, this is a, a matter dealing with the arrangements that uh, govern the uh, modus operandi of the Assembly and of the uh, Executive. And I think it needs to be borne out by the fact that uh, this was something that was predicted and predictable, uh, in that we recognised at St Andrews that the unusual arrangements that we were setting up could not be permanent arrangements, but would need to be reviewed. And we therefore, in the St Andrews Agreement and in the subsequent legislation, made provision for that review. Uh, and I, I don't think that there's anyone uh, in this chamber, and there's certainly very few outside, who believe that things are going so swimmingly in the Assembly and Executive that we're not uh, in need of uh, reform. I suppose, to some extent, uh, the argument that it isn't fit for, for purpose is one that perhaps even transcends the uh, Northern Ireland Assembly. I think I could probably make the, the same case for the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Government, uh, the uh, Westminster Parliament, Europe, uh, all of whom, I think, are looking at ways that they can improve the way that they operate. What kind of an assembly would we be if we missed the opportunity to try and improve the way we do uh, business and to get a better outcome for the people that we represent? Going to call Mr. Keir McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Would the First Minister agree with me that, among other issues, um, which makes present arrangements uh, not fit for purpose, as he would say, is caused indeed by the First Minister and his DUP party when they operate, for instance, the misuse of the, p the petition of concern, which gives the public the uh, reason for disillusionment with the Assembly in its entirety. Well, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, you, you allowed uh, the, the member to make those remarks, although they are a criticism of the chair. Uh, if anybody is misusing the procedures of the, the House, it would be the job of the chair to call them to, to order. Clearly, they are using the, proceedings, uh, the procedures of the, the House. The member may not like the way the uh, procedures of the House uh, are, are used, but that's an entirely uh, a different matter. But uh, petition of concern would be one of the many issues that I suspect that parties in this House would like to have further consideration and indeed some would want to have uh, reviewed. Uh, I am uh, you know, I I'm not uh, so tied to any of the procedures in this House that uh, I would stand up and say that they could not be improved. Uh, so uh, I'm sure that the, the member or his party in any discussions and negotiations that take place will raise that if that is one of the key issues for them. And I call Mr Mike Nesbitt. 
Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you. Uh, in light of uh, the First Minister's answers to date, uh, reflecting on the 2011 uh, DUP manifesto, which made the point that petitions of concern should not be used to block motions of no confidence, and considering how the DUP have deployed petitions of concern in this mandate, does he still believe in what he wrote in 2011? Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, it ill becomes anybody from the, the Ulster Unionist Party uh, to raise uh, these issues. Um, there are those in this chamber, and I think it is regrettable that there are those in this uh, chamber who put down party political motions of uh, no confidence. Uh, the, the reality is that we could every week be putting down a motion of no confidence in one party or uh, another or the representatives uh, in the, the executive. Uh, I think that we perhaps need a bit more mature thinking in the, the assembly rather than taking up the time of some committees, taking up time in this uh, assembly and get down to the business that people out there really want us to be doing, getting more jobs, yeah. improving the lot of people who are vulnerable in our society yeah. rather than the party bickering that sometimes goes on yeah. in this chamber. Yeah. Yeah. And I call Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the First Minister has referred to his comments about the institutions not being fit for purpose, and many people uh, indicated that that was an accurate summary, but he was criticised by a number of political parties, including Sinn Féin. And yet, over the weekend, uh, the former Minister, and now currently MP for Fermanagh South Tyrone, Michelle Gildenew, said that the institutions were untenable. Does he see a distinction between those two comments? Well, there clearly is a distinction between the two comments. Indeed, if I quote the, uh, the former uh, Minister for Agriculture and uh, Rural Affairs correctly, I think she said that it was perilous, indeed, I would say, uh, that uh, it was untenable. Um, however, I think all of us know that we are faced with a set of circumstances arising out of uh, issues relating to welfare reform, where we are going to be facing costs which simply cannot be taken into account by our budget. We cannot contemplate the reduction out of a £10 billion budget to carry out all of the programmes and processes of government, a reduction of over £1 billion a year. It just simply cannot be done. Uh, and uh, if people want to bury their head uh, in the, the sand, if they want to be in denial about these matters, if they want to fool themselves that somehow things could be different if there was another government uh, at Westminster, or indeed that somehow they can put pressure on the present coalition to change course, they are heading for a set of circumstances that will ensure that the most vulnerable people in our society are going to be worst hit because the very health service, education system, the justice system, all of the other elements of government that they need most will not be available to them without very considerable reductions in the service. Ms. Michaela Boyle. Uh, does the First Minister agree with me that there uh, should be a need for wide-ranging negotiations to include flags, parades and the past? Gormogat. Well, those who... Uh, took the time, and uh, I apologise for the length of the, the article, which uh, went into a couple of thousand words, but those who read it will see that I argued the case that though issues like flags, parades, the past have caused difficulties to our present circumstances, none of those was as, uh, capable of actually endangering the institutions and bringing them down. The matter of urgency is the way we operate as an assembly and executive and the issue of welfare reform. So while there certainly is a case that there are many issues that need to be discussed and where it's potentially advantageous if we can get a agreement, it is absolutely imperative that we deal with the matters that are capable of bringing this assembly and executive down. Don't fool yourselves about this issue. We simply cannot tolerate a set of circumstances where one billion pounds is to be taken off our budget. And if anybody wants to say, oh, these other items are more important or as important, let them tell me where they are going to make the reductions of £1 billion. It simply cannot be done. It's not something that's happening away down the road. Next financial year, almost £200 million is going to be taken out of our already squeezed budget as a result of welfare reform uh, issues. It simply is something that we cannot dodge. We must deal with it, and we must deal with it immediately. Mr. Jim Allister. 
The First Minister is on record as saying that things can't go on as they are. Does there come a point, therefore, if meaningful change is not made, when the First Minister will take that advice and uh, cease to sustain the institutions? And what are the red line issues that take him to that point? Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I, can I say to the, the member, there will be nobody in this chamber will be able to withstand the public outcry if we attempt to take a billion pounds out of our budget. The whole lot of us will be swept for office, and we would deserve to be swept from office if we were to tolerate such a set of uh, circumstances. It is, as the minister, former Minister for Agriculture said, it is simply not tenable. Call Mr. John McAllister. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, reflecting the First Minister's words about this place not been fit for purpose, how does the, does the First Minister perceive he will make achievements in getting a proper programme for government, collective cabinet responsibility, when the all-party talks process, there is nothing to stop any party walking out of that process for perceived political gains? Will he now give a commitment to support my private member's bill to bring in a government in opposition? I didn't know that the member had published his, his bill, so uh, it would be a very rash statement to support something that I haven't even uh, seen, though I'm sure it would be uh, full of uh, improvements. And having talked to him about the, the issue, I know that uh, certainly some of the issues that he uh, mentions uh, are ones that I, I would readily support, though I have some concerns about some of the, the issues that he has talked about. Uh, the, the fact that he has uh, in preparation a private member's bill to improve the way that the uh, Assembly functions is an indicator that there is uh, clearly a need for us to upgrade the uh, Assembly and Executive's functions and arrangements. Uh, if we take that as a given, then I have had uh, a meeting, I think, with uh, every party and uh, those who uh, are independents in, in this House. And I have to say that the, the meetings that I have had had a, a realistic uh, recognition on the part of everybody that I spoke to that we needed to uh, improve the way we operate. Unquestionably, there will be people that will come from different uh, angles uh, as to what are the priorities in terms of, of change. But let us at least accept, first of all, the need for change. When we accept the need for change, then I believe that we can start a proper uh, and helpful debate uh, about what those changes can be, how they will impact uh, on the delivery that we have for the, the, the public, and how we can be sure that we don't end up with deadlock, that we actually can get decisions taken within the Assembly and Executive. Thank you. And can I inform the House that question 9 has been withdrawn? And I call Mr Jimmy Spratt. Question 2, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Assembly and Executive Review Committee has a statutory responsibility under Section 29A of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 to report before 1 May 2015 on the operation of Parts 3 and 4 of that Act, which set out the arrangements for the devolved institutions. The Committee began its review in 2012, producing separate reports that year on the future size of the Assembly and the number of government departments. It has since produced reports on the De Hunt arrangements, community designation, provisions for an opposition, and most recently on petitions of concern. The Committee is currently undertaking further important work regarding the role of women in politics and in the Assembly. The Deputy First Minister and I met with the Chair and Deputy Chair of the Committee on 4 April 2012 at the start of its review. Where appropriate, we may make representations to the Committee as it conducts further work in relation to Parts 3 and 4 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. In the past, when there was an agreed position on matters under review by the Committee, representations were made, notably in relation to the devolution of policing and justice. In circumstances where further agreements are reached, we would anticipate making further representations to the Committee. We welcome the work of the Committee and the opportunity its reports present for Assembly plenary debate on our structures of government. Mr. Spratt for a supplementary. Thank you. Uh, can I ask the First Minister, in light of the announcement by the Prime Minister following the rejection of the Scottish independence referendum, mm. uh, does he think that the Assembly Executive Review Committee uh, could play a useful role uh, in the discussion around devolution, 
for Northern Ireland in the wider United Kingdom context? Well, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, in the context of uh, the 1998 Act, there is a requirement uh, for the ARC Committee uh, to carry out a review before May of 2015 on internal Northern Ireland matters. But there is no exclusion placed uh, on the Assembly uh, or the Committee in terms of looking at wider issues relating to Northern Ireland's place within the United Kingdom. Uh, the structures that would best suit Northern Ireland uh, in terms of our relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom. I think it would be a very useful exercise for the, the committee, and one which I, I think all parties uh, in this chamber uh, need to be considering over the next number of weeks uh, and months. An important debate has begun in the United Kingdom. It is clear that there are going to be changes in the operation of uh, our constitution as a part of this uh, nation. We want to be sure, as uh, parties in this uh, Assembly, that we get the best possible uh, arrangements uh, for Northern Ireland. Already in the uh, economic pact that was signed by the Deputy First Minister and myself and by the, the Prime Minister, uh, there is an agreement to look at all the fiscal levers uh, that are at uh, the disposal of the United Kingdom to see if any of them could be devolved uh, to Northern Ireland. Uh, and it is much in that same vein that I think uh, the pledge that was made to, to Scotland uh, was set out. Uh, so that is already is an undertaking that we have from the United Kingdom Government uh, and one that uh, we are presently doing work on uh, within the finance and personnel uh, in terms of the financial levers. Uh, however, there are wider constitutional matters uh, about our place at Westminster, the role that uh, our MPs would have at Westminster, the House of Lords, whether it could be a more representative uh, chamber in relation to the, the regions. There are a number of different issues that the committee uh, could and should look at, but it shouldn't be them exclusively. I think as political parties we should be doing it too. Thank you. And can I remind the Minister just of the two-minute rule? I call Mr Alec Maskey. Could I ask the First Minister, does he, does he actually agree that any review of the Assembly structures uh, must be rooted firmly within the terms of the Good Friday Agreement itself? The Belfast uh, Agreement uh, was uh, not like the law of the Medes and Persians, which changeth not. Uh, it was a, a recognition that uh, there was room for improvement, that there was room for updating, there was room for upgrading. And indeed, if uh, the member was right, then we would never have had a St Andrews Agreement and we would never have had a Hillsborough Castle uh, Agreement. So clearly, things do move on, improvements are made uh, along the, the, the way, uh, and certainly nothing should be done in terms of uh, a new agreement that uh, destabilises uh, political life uh, in Northern Ireland uh, and uh, allows us to go back to those dark days of the past. Minister, when he says that only welfare could bring down the institutions, it is only a matter of months, months ago, First Minister, when you threatened these institutions around an issue from the past. So don't be inconsistent on this chamber today. Could I ask the First Minister, could I ask the First Minister, um, do you believe that the issues of the AERC about the institutions, petitions of concern and the rest are part of the negotiations that you have called for? Or is the truth of it that you just want a negotiation to break parties on welfare, get corporation tax and put all the other issues, parades in the past, <coughs> into the long grass? Well, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, once again, uh, characteristically, the member gets it wrong. I never threatened these institutions at all. I indicated that I could not remain uh, in government if there was not a judge-led uh, inquiry into the OTR uh, issue. I'm glad that there was a judge-led uh, inquiry. I'm glad that that inquiry made recommendations. Yeah. I'm glad that the government accepted those recommendations. Yeah. And I'm glad that as a result of them accepting those recommendations, the validity uh, of the, the letters has now changed uh, and they will no longer be able to be relied on by anybody who uh, yeah. the police want to, to deal with. Uh, having dealt with his uh, inaccuracy rather than my inconsistency, uh, let me deal with the, the issue about what would be on the agenda in terms of the modalities uh, of uh, the Assembly and Executive. Uh, I am indicating that I want to improve the arrangements in this Assembly and for the, the Executive. 
It would be utter folly in wanting to improve the modalities of the House if I was to suggest that people should not have the ability to, to raise and seek agreement uh, on issues which are important uh, to them. So, of course, we will look at uh, all of the, the issues to see how best we can get a properly effective and efficient running uh, assembly and the executive so that decisions can be taken. They don't lie uh, in, in deadlock. And I would have thought amongst those who would have been cheering me from the rafters was the party whose leader a long time ago recognised that the ugly scaffolding of the agreement needed to be removed. <laughs> You're in a call, Mr. Raymond McCartney. <coughs> three, question number three, please. Is that number three? Yep. <clears throat> Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. The current programme for government sets out our vision for a society in which equality, mutual trust and respect are core values. Achieving this vision requires not just tackling sectarianism and racism, but other forms of intolerance as well. The Together Building a United Community strategy recognises the problems LG and B people face due to prejudice and intolerance. The specific needs of LG and B people were articulated clearly in the course of the public consultation on the draft strategy for cohesion, sharing and integration, which included the commitment to publish the sexual orientation strategy. We remain committed to publishing a sexual orientation strategy which will be informed by a full public consultation. The intention is that the strategy and the associated action plans will address the issues that impact on the daily lives of LG and B people. Thank you. And I call Mr. Raymond McCart. Thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for that answer. I welcome the fact that the Minister talks about equality and mutual respect being the core principles and that we have to do away with prejudice and intolerance. Would the Minister agree with me that that, that strategy would be severely undermined, if not weakened, by the fact that there continues to be a nonsensical ban on gay men given blood? Well, that's a matter for the Department for Health. And I call Mr. Colin Eastwood. Mr. Speaker, can I thank the Junior Minister for his answer thus far? Um, can he tell me the when uh, this issue was last raised at the Executive and who it was raised by? Well, the, the, the member, uh, if he doesn't know, should know that I'm not permitted to give out the content, content of executive business. I, think, uh, I call Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the junior minister for his responses? And could he inform the House whether the consultation responses contain any reference to current legislation, legislative protections for the LGB community? Yes, uh, of responses and uh, in discussions that we have had with uh, a range of groups, we have also looked at what the existing uh, legislation is that seeks to tackle uh, discrimination based on sexual orientation. Um, any new strategy can raise awareness and give effect to current legislation. So, in our drafting of a strategy in OFM, DFM, we will highlight that the strategy can help give effect to existing legal protections to ensure that they are properly understood and that they are properly enacted. It can highlight that the strategy can address issues that are outside the scope of existing legal protection. And I think everyone in this House uh, has a commitment to support good relations and also addressing bullying in any form in which it comes. Thank you. And I call Ms. Sandra Overend. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister John Bell to answer this question. Thank you. The Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety and OFM DFM officials have been working together to agree how best to take forward the development of an internet safety strategy for Northern Ireland. Given its statutory duty to work together to safeguard children and young people 
and to promote their welfare. It was agreed that an approach should be made to the safeguarding board for Northern Ireland to seek its approval in principle to take forward the development of an interagency internet safety strategy. In June 2014, agreement in principle was obtained from the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland. With the agreement of all executive ministers, it is intended that the development of the strategy will be formally commissioned on behalf of the executive. Ms. Overend for supplementary. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the junior minister for his answers. I, they will not be surprised that I am pressing them again on this internet safety strategy, uh, considering I have been on their backs about this since uh, the autumn of 2012. Um, surely uh, the, the minister uh, within OFM, DFM, and the minister for health could come to some sort of agreement uh, sooner rather than later and allocate uh, whatever amount of money uh, needs to, to be given to the safeguarding board for this uh, draft and, and get on with the job. Can the minister indicate a time frame and can the minister indicate how much money is needed to progress with this, please? Well, the member has uh, been very encouraging in terms of the work that she's done with OFM, DFM to date and with the charitable sector in relation to what, what has been done. Um, and while uh, we look to develop that strategy within the Department of Health, it would be wrong for anybody to go out without an understanding of the work that is currently underway. I'm not just talking about the work that we've done in schools, St. Ida's, Wellington College, the work that we have done uh, reaching key players in the European Union, because that's where the uh, driver will come to those major internet players that put the content out there onto the internet. We have uh, fully engaged with the Facebook. We went to their European headquarters in Dublin uh, to address what they could do and to support the ambassadors against uh, bullying, uh, particularly the young people from our schools in Northern Ireland who are taking a lead role as ambassadors against uh, bullying uh, on the internet. And we've also been part of a major conference in OFM, DFM with COFACI, which is one of the, the major charities on the European scene that's seeking to protect children. I think one th uh, thing that should go out is a very simple point for all of our young people, that they treat their personal information the exact same way as they would treat their toothbrush. They don't share it, and they certainly don't share it over the internet. Call Mr. William Humphrey. Well, in, in their work, as they work alongside the Department of Health and Public Safety as well? Well, recognising the role that's been played by the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety in child protection, I should also pay tribute to the member for the work that he's undertaken in North Belfast to keep children safe, uh, particularly in relation to cybercrime and cyberbullying. But we have taken uh, the advantage of our own central role in the executive to help inform the discussions on how we can best protect children from abuse through the internet, including uh, we commissioned research uh, to gain a better understanding of internet use by P7 pupils. We engaged with the United Kingdom Safer Internet Centre, the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland and many of the relevant stakeholder organisations. A review of activity on internet safety across all the relevant departments we undertook to identify what the current actions were, where the gaps were, and any further actions that needed to be taken to address the risks. In addition, we recognised the importance of ensuring that clear messages were provided to parents, to children and to practitioners. And we have been supportive of the recent report from the Safeguarding Board on this issue. Public awareness is critical to addressing the issue, and as Ministers, we will be happy to play our part through the events that give us the, the platform to do that, such as Safer Internet Day, to ensure that the correct messages are communicated and that our children and young people stay safe. We have advised Minister Poots that the cross-departmental structure which we have developed for delivering social change, that framework provides the ideal opportunity to coordinate work 
on internet safety right across the executive. And that uh, ends the period for listed questions, and we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mr. Jerry Kelly. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Given the uh, result of the Scottish referendum, does the First Minister now agree that uh, we should be arguing for the fullest uh, possible uh, transfer of uh, fiscal powers to the Assembly? Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm sure the Member will join me in uh, welcoming the outcome of the uh, Scottish <laughs> referendum uh, and the strong desire to retain the uh, Union uh, with the, the rest of the, the United Kingdom. Uh, in welcoming that, uh, I recognise that he wants to strengthen the, the Union uh, by improving the uh, structures within the, the United Kingdom. Uh, and in that context, uh, as I indicated uh, in question time earlier, uh, we already do have a commitment uh, from the United Kingdom Government in the uh, economic pact signed by the Deputy First Minister and myself with the Prime Minister, David Cameron, uh, that uh, we would consider all of the fiscal levers to see what further powers should be devolved. Uh, though uh, I do not accept the premise that uh, simply transferring the economic levers into the hands of the Assembly necessarily is going to transform uh, the social and economic policy of Northern Ireland. Uh, there is a, a limit to the impact that uh, many of those taxes and other arrangements uh, would uh, enable the, the executive to make real and meaningful uh, change. So there is no panacea to be found in that, but there is a significant cost if we were to take over responsibility for some of those uh, elements, if we are having to operate them ourselves uh, and we do not have the economy of scale of the whole of the United Kingdom operating them. Mr. Kelly for supplementary. Uh, I thank the, uh, the First Minister for his answer up to now. Let me not join him in uh, welcoming the result of the, the referendum. However, there has been a referendum, and, and the issue at stake here, and I ask the, the, the First Minister again, is uh, there is an impression, certainly, that the DUP are not up for uh, more power being brought to uh, the Assembly here, and could he? Uh, not agree that while Scotland is arguing for more uh, powers, and especially in the fiscal area in terms of taxes and others, that we uh, should be getting as much power uh, here as is possible so that we can have an impact on the economy and on the lives of uh, people in the north, as opposed to leaving it to the whim of uh, people in, uh, in London. The first thing we need to ask ourselves when we look at taking any additional power is, first of all, can we operate it? Have we got the cohesion in our uh, executive and assembly to be able to take decisions on uh, taxation matters? Secondly, if we had that power, is there a financial incentive to us? Is there an advantage to us? Or is it simply tax more uh, is the, the answer uh, that uh, some people are going to give? Uh, and thirdly, if we are going to have that power, is there going to be a cost to us in operating that power? And I suppose there is a fourth question, and that is, what social or economic change can we bring about by exercising that power? Uh, and if I look at some of the, the, the taxes that are available, uh, issues like stamp duty land tax, uh, I would have thought that uh, there is probably little difficulty in us operating such a, a, a scheme. It is doable. I do not think it will transform uh, the economy in Northern Ireland uh, if we do it, and there will be a small cost uh, attached to it, but it certainly is doable. Uh, there are issues like VAT. I think uh, if VAT was to be considered, there would be some very major EU difficulties uh, in Northern Ireland being given those powers, but even if it was being uh, devolved around the, the United uh, Kingdom, there would be very considerable costs. Uh, although, on the upside, it would allow you, for instance, to look at uh, hotels, restaurants and other tourist-led uh, functions and uh, reduce VAT so that you could increase that element uh, of your, uh, of your uh, economy. So there are levers that you could use if you had VAT control. I don't think you'll get it because of, of Europe, and I think there will be a cost in us uh, exercising it. Landfill tax, again, is, is doable, but it's not going to have the transformative change that the member is looking at. Corporation tax is, in my view, doable and valuable, and we should continue to, to seek it. Income tax, which is 
been offered to the, the, the Scots and which is uh, up for referendum uh, in Wales uh, is going to be a very considerable difficulty and a very significant cost, uh, as indeed uh, would uh, some of the other elements such as national insurance contributions. So uh, this is no panacea. There are problems that need to be thoroughly investigated, and I'm glad that the Department of Finance and Personnel is already preparing papers on each of those elements. I call Mr. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the First Minister, in light of the Scottish referendum and the clear evidence that there was a much greater participation by all generations, not just in the debate but also in the vote, and some would put that down to the extension of voting rights for 16 to 17 year olds, how would the First Minister view that? Well, I, I'm, clearly, if you uh, allow more people to, to vote, then the, the uh, possibility of increased voting is uh, inevitable. Uh, but the voting was so high uh, right across uh, Scotland that it indicated that the issues at stake in this election were of such importance to the people of uh, Scotland of every age group uh, that uh, we had a, a massive uh, poll. Uh, unfortunately, when we get round to uh, parliamentary, assembly or European uh, elections, there's a whole range of issues. The importance of any significant issue does not outweigh your constitutional status. So people come out depending on how important they view uh, an election. And I think that's the same whether you're 16 or 17 or whether you're 60 or 70. Call Mr. Ramsey for supplement. Yeah, I thank the First Minister for his response, but I think he may have glossed over the particular point that I was making. Does the First Minister not believe that it is important to hear the views of our young people in particular, who feel marginalised and, and feel apathetic towards politics. Will he undertake a review in conjunction with consulting with young people the role that they should play in future elections? That is a, a transferred uh, matter, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I think no matter what age you stipulate uh, in legislation, there can always be a case made for reducing it. And if it was 16 and 17, there would be people coming along in a few years' time telling us that 15-year-olds are now more mature than they've ever been before and they're interested in politics and we should reduce it. And so it go goes on, so that along with your birth certificate, you'll be uh, registering for uh, uh, elections. So I think we do need to recognise that uh, there, there is a, 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 an age when we can be certain that people understand the, the, the issues, that they are likely to come out in the appropriate numbers, uh, and where they have had sufficient experience of life to enable them to take uh, key decisions. Uh, I think people are younger and younger more capable uh, of taking major decisions. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, we have reached the stage where such a significant change should be, should be made. Uh, and happily, I think that's a, a matter for Westminster as a reserve matter. And question three has been withdrawn within the appropriate procedures and time frame. So we move on to question four, Mr. Pat Sheehan. In the context of the proposed LCM, the Child Care Payments Bill, can the First Minister confirm that stakeholder engagements will formally address or consider all options to address any potential gaps identified in child care provision following the introduction of the new scheme? I will ask my colleague Jonathan Bell to answer this question. The member uh, raises a very important point uh, about the replacement of what was the childcare scheme, which, which uh, is repealed. And therefore, uh, if we were to continue with uh, what there was previously in existence, we would have to look at a legislative change. I think what we want to do for all of our parents uh, out there is to ensure that we have got a simplified child care tax scheme. The previous uh, mechanism for many parents that we have spoken to, and I'm sure all members are the same as myself in our constituency offices, find it cumbersome, difficult, complex, very difficult to negotiate. And therefore, that when we look at child care, we should be looking towards a simplified scheme, a scheme that is looking towards the equivalent uh, in terms of tax and looking at how we could use that uh, investment that's made. I think there are two wins um, which we want to make. Uh, the first win would be to ensure that the benefit uh, for those people that need uh, childcare increases, if at all possible, and secondly, that there, it is used and taken up by a greater number of people, and that will be our focus in the period to come. 
Mr. Sheehan for a supplementary. I wonder, will the department uh, invite both the employment or the employers for childcare and the ICTU, among others, uh, to engage on their concerns about the new provision? Well, we've already, and I've already been in uh, a number of meetings uh, in the course of this office with uh, employers for childcare that have met with a range uh, of trade union bodies, and it's important. Uh, that we would listen to all of the views that uh, are expressed to see uh, what can be done. Um, I am pleased to inform the House that we have pushed ahead, not only in this scheme, but in terms of our Bright Start strategy. We have looked at where we can base that strategy within schools and use the existing school estate so that more uh, young people can access the care that is there that we can develop the social enterprises in communities where there is limited childcare. And remember, when school age childcare can be up to 1 in 19 in certain areas where you are competing for a place, uh, but where we could use uh, social enterprise and apply uh, any profits that are made back into the community. We have looked at the needs in rural issues, uh, rural areas that was raised as an issue to us, and have specifically looked at a childminder scheme uh, for the rural areas and of most concern for lifting people out of poverty was the issue of deprivation, all of which have been tackled within OFM, DFM's Bright Start scheme. And I call Mr. Colin Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the First Minister for his, assessments, his assessment on the progress of the North West Gateway Initiative? Okay. I'll ask uh, Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. Well, there's been a number of meetings that uh, have uh, taken place, particularly in relation to the, the One Plan and the Interdepartmental uh, Working Group uh, that exists there. That group provides the strategic analysis and provides the advice uh, to the executive, to other departments, and to the London Dairy Strategy Board uh, on the most appropriate means through which the executive policies, their programmes, and their projects can positively impact on the themes and programmes that uh, are identified within that plan. Uh, the group is also monitoring progress and providing the forum for the discussion and the resolution of cross-cutting issues that are affecting more than one uh, department. The interdepartmental group meets formally twice a year, with the next meeting, I believe, scheduled in October. Uh, so progress continues to be made on the implementation of the one plan across each of the Catalyst programmes to grow the economy and to provide more local jobs. Mr. Eastwood for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, given that one of the key catalytic projects within the One Plan was the expansion of McGee, uh, can the Minister or the First Minister give us uh, their level of commitment to seeing that happen by 2020? The issue, the issue of the University of Ulster uh, at McGee and expansion. The Minister for Employment and Learning uh, recognised that the One Plan saw, foresaw the expansion of higher education in Londonderry as key to the city's regeneration, and he is committed to the expansion of higher education throughout Northern Ireland. The One Plan had an additional target of 1,000 additional undergraduate places by 2015. The Minister for Employment and Learning has been on has been able to increase the number of undergraduate places in the two universities by 1,210. The University of Ulster has received uh, 652, and these have been deployed at McGee. Any expansion of undergraduate numbers beyond uh, what has already been achieved would require additional recurring funding. Uh, which I understand the Department of Employment and Learning currently does not have. An economic appraisal is being prepared for the expansion of McGee by the London Dairy Strategy Board. Uh, if the appraisal makes the case that expansion is in the best interests of Northern Ireland uh, and the city, the Employment and Learning uh, Minister proposes to submit a bid in the next comprehensive spending review. Uh, time is up.